here. So hello everyone, we have a special guest today. Uh, some of you may know him, if not, I would like to introduce him. It's a Professor Sam Vaknin, the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited and uh, Professor of Finance and Psychology in CIAS, um, CIAS Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies. Hello, Sam. Hello, just two corrections. I'm a former visiting professor of psychology. And now I resign my post as a professor of psychology. I'm only a professor of finance. So psychology is in my past, but still on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So today I would like to ask you some questions about um, how narcissists is affected us and how narcissist voice is uh, becomes ours. I think it's really important thing to understand in the healing journey for everyone uh, who was, you know, uh, affected by by, nar by narcissists. So, so yes, maybe let's start by uh, describing like a typical profile of a victim of narcissist uh, abuse. Narcissists team up, they they create couples, who, um, and we are talking only about intimate relationships, but actually everything yes. we're about to say applies to friendships, the workplace, studies, all, all relationships with narcissists are structured the same way, because narcissists don't recognize or experience intimacy. As far as the narcissist is concerned, there is no such thing as intimate relationship. <laughs> all relationships mm -hmm. are the same, and the goal of all relationships is narcissistic supply. Mm -hmm. um, the intimate partner provides also services, sometimes sex, sometimes other things. But generally, the narcissist doesn't have a preference for any specific type. If you provide the narcissist what, of, with what he needs, then you're good to go. So many narcissists team up with psychopaths, for example. Many narcissists mm. have borderlines as partners, codependents, or just normal, healthy, regular people. It is a myth. It's not true that narcissists have a preferred, preferred type. Narcissists couldn't care less if you have empathy, because I go online and I see many victims and self-styled victims, so-called empaths, I don't know what else, they keep saying, the narcissist chose me because I'm a good person, because I have empathy. Narcissists couldn't care less if you have empathy. He doesn't have empathy. He doesn't need empathy. He, he needs supply and, so, and services. So the narcissist um, is indiscriminate. He's promiscuous. The, but it is true that certain types of people are more attracted to narcissists. So, for mm -hmm. example, borderline people with borderline personality disorder would be more attracted to narcissists. And the same goes for dependent personality disorder, also known as codependency. Codependents and borderlines are the most attracted to narcissists because narcissists provide them with the illusion of safety and external regulation. The, the, borderlines, the borderline cannot regulate her emotions. She cannot control her moods. She has lability. She has dysregulation. And she outsources her mind, her internal processes to the narcissist. So he becomes a part of her mind. And this is known as external regulation. The codependent teams up with the, with the narcissist because the narcissist is delighted to take over all the daily functions to control the life of the codependent because the narcissist feels grandiose. He feels, he feels like he's godlike. So the codependent allows the narcissist to feel godlike and the borderline allows the narcissist to feel like her best friend, her, her rock, the one who calms her down, the one who gives her inner peace, the one who reduces her anxiety, the one around which she feels stable and safe and wonderful. So that's why they are attracted to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. So how is it come that um, narcissist voice is becoming ours? Like, how would this process look like? 
The narcissist does what Josef Goebbels said. Josef Goebbels said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it's true. The narcissist's secret source, his secret technique, is repetition. The narcissist simply repeats. He has a limited repertory of sentences. Some of these sentences are highly positive. They are sentences of idealization. So in the love bombing phase, the narcissist would repeat the same sentences, but they would be positive sentences. They would idealize mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. also has a repertory of negative sentences. And when he abuses you, he will repeat these negative sentences. Now, we have known since 2006 that if you repeat the same sentences again and again, they have an impact on the brain. They somehow affect the brain. It's very similar with music. It's the same with music and so on. But we didn't know how it's done. And now we know how it's done. It's a yeah. process called entraining. It seems that if you repeat the same sentence again and again and again, and if you are a figure of authority, if there's an asymmetry of authority, you're perceived as an authoritative figure, or if the other person is dependent on you, so there is an asymmetry of power or asymmetry of trust, then these sentences would synchronize your brain waves with the abuser's brain waves. The, there will be a synchronization mm -hmm. of brain waves, literally mm -hmm. physical brain waves. So your brain would become a replica of the abuser's brain. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's much more than it brainwashing. Is. It's much more than brainwashing. It's simply taking over your brain and making mm -hmm. your brain an extension of the abuser's brain. And that is known as entraining. Now, we discovered mm -hmm. entraining in music. We found out in experiments conducted 10 years ago that when people play music together, their brains become one brain. Mm -hmm. All the brains of the members of a rock band or a pop group, all the, all the brains of all the members, the drummer, the bassist, the singer, all the brains begin to emit simultaneously identical wave patterns. They become essentially a single brain, like a colony, like a hive, a single brain. And this is what happens in abuse. The abuser creates a single brain with you. So effectively, this is merger and fusion. From that moment on, the only voice is the abuser's voice. You don't have a voice anymore. Because mm -hmm. the abuser has taken over your, your brain, his voice is the only voice, of course. His mm -hmm. voice synchronizes your brain with his brain. And so gradually, his voice silences all the other voices in your mind. Now, just to be clear, all people, including healthy people, they have internal voices. These mm -hmm. internal voices are known as introjects. These internal voices belong to very significant people in your life. So you have an internal voice of your mother, internal voice of your father, an important teacher, peers, influential peers, even media figures, even role models, even politicians, even influencers, they have they create inside you an introject, a voice. When you're exposed to narcissistic abuse, via the process of entraining, all these voices, without exception, they are silenced. And the only voice in your head that resonates in your head is the abuser's voice. Now, sometimes the voice of the abuser will collaborate with other voices inside your mind in order to accomplish some manipulative goal. So for example, if you have a voice of a mother, an introject of your mother, and this voice is telling you, you are not good, you are bad, you are a failure, you are unworthy. So the abuser will collaborate with this voice. His voice will create a coalition with your mother's voice and will mm -hmm. amplify it. So mm -hmm. ultimately, what is left in your mind are only the negative introjects, only the introjects that put you down, only the introjects asso associated with what we call a bad object. The abuser 
convinces you gradually that you are bad, inadequate, insufficient, a failure, a loser, ugly, stupid, and so on and so forth. And he does this by creating these alliances of similar voices inside your mind. And this is why when the abuser is done, his voice remains inside your mind. Mm -hmm. So after this, uh, this process, uh, and when we are, you know, um, yeah, after a uh, relationship, uh, any kind, uh, with a narcissist, can we become NPD then? After this kind of abuse? It's well documented that people who suffered from complex trauma, CPTSD, yeah. begin to display narcissistic and even psychopathic uh, behaviors. Mm -hmm. They acquire some superficial psychopathic and narcissistic traits. Their empathy is reduced dramatically. The capacity to empathize is dramatically reduced. This is common to all trauma, by the way. All trauma victims have difficulties with, uh, with empathy. And so for a little while, a few months, up to a few years, your behavior as a victim of abuse, prolonged abuse, um, could become indistinguishable from the behavior of a narcissist or even, or even a psychopath. And mm -hmm. this is, but luckily this is reversible as the effects of the trauma wear off as you go, as you're exposed to therapy, which you should, if you're a victim of narcissistic abuse, you should attend therapy. Then these traits and behaviors gradually, gradually disappear. So this mm. is artificial. This is superficial. This is not lifelong. Okay. Mm -hmm. So after this, when we decided that we are going to the therapy, any kind, um, what we should do first before we start any kind, like, you know, Gestalt or internal family system or, you know, a psychodynamic, doesn't matter. But uh, what is the most important uh, thing to do with this, especially, you know, with this voice? Because if this voice is affected us, then this voice can take any method and, you know, any experiment, any exercise that uh, we can learn to use this against us, isn't it? Yes, very true. That's very true. This voice co-opts, it uses anything you learn, anything you mm -hmm. learn, especially anything you learn about yourself, and then uses mm -hmm. it against you. It's like, you know, when you're arrested in the United States, they tell you anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. So mm -hmm. it's the same. The first thing you need to do as a victim is stop considering yourself a victim. You have been victimized. It doesn't make you a victim. In other words, don't adopt victimhood as an identity. Don't become a victim as a, as a definition of who you are. You are mm -hmm. not a victim. You have been victimized. That's the first thing. The second thing, you must recognize your contribution to what had, to what had happened. If you deny that you have had any contribution, if you say, I was a perfect angel, I was a perfect angel, and my abuser is a perfect demon, is the devil, you know? And so it was an accident. It could have happened to anyone. I did nothing wrong. I did not contribute anything to it. Then you will never heal. You will never heal, and you will repeat the same mistake again and again and again. All, all people who are victimized by abusers, especially by narcissists and so on, do contribute to their own abuse. And they need to ask themselves, what did I do wrong? For example, maybe the way I'm selecting intimate partners is wrong. Maybe I had psychological needs and the narcissist fulfilled these needs in the wrong way. Maybe I wanted to be abused in some way. This is known as projective identification because I consider myself a bad object which should be punished. Maybe I have self-destructiveness and self-defeat self and the urge to self-punish because I self-love or I don't love myself enough. Maybe there is a self-love deficit. So mm -hmm. 
The first stage, I am not a victim. That's not my identity. I have been victimized. The second stage, I contributed to my predicament. I contributed to the situation that I find myself now. How? How did I do that? And how not to do this again? The third phase, and this is before going to therapy. The third mm -hmm. phase. The third phase is to say, uh, I have voices talking to me inside my head, which is totally normal, by the way. Every human being has. Mm -hmm. right? I, I have mm -hmm. voices. For example, if you have a conscience, a conscience, whenever you want to do something, your conscience tells you, don't do this. This is wrong. It's not okay to do this. So your conscience is a voice inside your head that tells you what is right and what is wrong. It's an example of an introject. So the, the third thing you need to do, the third step is to ask yourself, which, are, which of these voices are mine and which of these voices are not mine? Which of these voices are authentic, authentic and which of these voices are inauthentic? And now, how would you identify? How would you know? You have the voice. Yeah, that your... was my uh, another question. Yeah, how yeah. to recognize recognize which yeah. voice is which? It's there's actually a very simple way. You have you have a voice of a mother inside your head, and to prevent ego ego dystonia, to prevent discomfort, to prevent inconvenience, you lie to yourself and you say, "This is not my mother's voice. This is my voice." So very often we adopt the introjects as us. We identify with the introjects. The process is called identification. We identify with the introjects in order to prevent ego dystonia, to prevent extreme dissonance, to prevent anxiety. We say these voices are, these are my voices. These are authentic voices. And actually they're not. They're your mother's voice. They're your abuser's voice. They're not your voice. So how do you know? How can you tell? I'm going to give you one simple rule. If the voice is negative most of the time about you. If the voice puts you down, criticizes you all the time, never gives you a compliment, tells you that you're bad, inadequate, insufficient, unworthy, failure, stupid, ugly, and so on. If these are the messages of the introject, if these are the automatic thoughts generated by the voice, this voice is not yours. Simple. A voice that is yours will be reality-based, reality-tested, and balanced. It will be a balanced voice. So this kind of voice sometimes will tell you, bravo, you did a good thing. You should congratulate yourself. You deserve a glass of wine or a new handbag. And Or, or this kind of voice will tell you, you see how he's looking at you? Your hands, you're beautiful, you know? Or this voice will tell you, look at how much you've accomplished in life. And sometimes this voice will tell you, you really screwed up. You know, you didn't think, you didn't think to the end. Next time, think to the end. So a voice that is yours is like the voice of a good friend, or like the voice of a truly loving mother or a truly loving father. It's a voice that is reality-based and yeah. balanced. A voice that is 95% of the time negative and wants to pull you down and put you down and destroy you and criticize you harshly and so on is sadistic voice that is never, ever your voice. Never. So this mm -hmm. is stage three. Stage three mm -hmm. is to identify the voices that are not your voices. And mm -hmm. stage four, and the last one before you go to therapy, is to silence these voices. Whenever the voices which are not you, the inauthentic voices, begin to criticize you or use bad object characterization of you, you silence them. How do you silence them? You say, mm -hmm. shut up. That's all you say. Shut up. Now. Okay, if it's if it's not working, just shut up. It does work. If you if you intervene early in the voice, you don't let mm -hmm. it speak. You, you use your voice to silence it. You say, shut up, I don't mm -hmm. want to listen to you. I know I know you don't want, I know you're my enemy. I know you don't like me, I know you don't want. So you don't let the voice speak. You, you flood it mm -hmm. with your own messaging. At the beginning, mm -hmm. it's not gonna work. 
but after a while, these voices will be silenced because they will not be able mm -hmm. to express themselves. We have a principle in psychology. It's called the principle of mental economy. Anything that cannot be used will atrophy and die. So if there is something inside you that you cannot use, you, you will lose it. It's called use it or lose it. If you have voices inside you and you keep silencing them all the time, finally they will die because they are not needed anymore. This is the principle of mental <laughs> economy. And this is what we do in CBT. In CBT, yeah. in Cognitive Behavior Therapy, we identify negative automatic thoughts. Automatic thoughts such as, I will always fail, or I'm very fat, or I'm ugly, no one would want to date me. You know, these are negative automatic thoughts. And then what we do in Cognitive Behavior Therapy, we demonstrate to you that these voices are wrong. And how do we do that? We force you to use other voices. We force you to use other information. This other information contradicts the voice. And whenever the voice comes up, you use that information. So for example, if the voice says, you're ugly, no one will ever date you. You say, but it's not true. I dated five men in the last 10 years. And this is a voice. This, this replica, this response to the negative voice is like another voice. So gradually the automatic negative voice shuts up and disappears. CBT is the most successful treatment modality in the world. It's the most, most efficacious, most efficient treatment there is. And this is exactly what it does. It silences automatic negative thoughts. So you should, you should apply self-CBT to some extent. Then when you're finished with these four phases, you're ready for therapy. If you go to therapy before you finish these four phases, yeah. the narcissist inside your mind will take over the therapy, will dominate the therapy, and will abuse the therapy against you. And mm -hmm. this is why victims or people who consider themselves being victimized, they complain that the therapist becomes a friend of the narcissist. The therapist is mm -hmm. co compromised by the narcissist. And that is quite true. It's true when the narcissist is there because the narcissist is charming and manipulative and so on. But it's also true when the narcissist is not there. The yeah. therapist will react very strongly to the narcissist's voice. And so the therapist needs your help also. He, the therapist mm -hmm. also needs your help because if you come to the therapist and you're still contaminated, adulterated, infected with the narcissist's voice, it will make it very difficult for the therapist as well. And very often mm -hmm. the therapist will make a mistake and believe that voice, not you, and begin to collaborate with that voice against you, even a well-trained therapist. Everyone knows mm -hmm. in, in, ter in, in, psycho in, in the field, in the profession, everyone, that the most difficult patients to treat are narcissists and borderlines. Everyone knows this. Yeah. And the reason it's very difficult to treat them is that very often they corrupt the therapy. They contaminate the therapy. They infect the process of therapy. And so the process is destroyed from the inside because the narcissist corrupted the therapist, corrupted the therapy, and it's no longer helpful. So don't, don't, I'm sorry, don't bring the narcissist with you to the therapy. Even if the narcissist mm -hmm. is inside your head, don't bring him with you to the therapy. That's all mm -hmm. I'm saying. Now I'll put my glasses back. <laughs> yeah, I, I do agree, especially um, what you said before, that what I can see uh, when I'm working with people, that the main problem is uh, a lot of them they don't want to take the responsibility for um, what was, you know, uh, their impact there. And this is the main uh, point where they stuck. They cannot move when they will not take this uh, responsibility. I can, I can tell even, uh, you know, in my own therapy, the first thing that I uh, made was like, yes, I'm, I'm taking my part uh, and I'm taking responsibility. 
And uh, and I can say that that was the most important thing on the beginning. I think that because problems. then people yeah yeah please mm -hmm. go ahead I'm sorry yeah yeah you know yeah go ahead. I think there are two problems. If you don't admit your role, if you don't admit your contribution, mm -hmm. maybe it's not responsibility, mm -hmm. but if you don't admit your contribution to the abuse, there are two problems with it. First of all, yeah. it means that you are an object. You're objectifying yourself. If you didn't do anything, if you didn't contribute anything, it, then you are like an object. The narcissist comes and he uses you like an object and he goes. So you are objectifying yourself. You are taking away your autonomy. You are taking away your agency. You are you don't have. So this is the first outcome. The narcissist wants to objectify you. This is what the narcissist wants to do. He wants you to feel like an object, and you are helping him when you say, "I'm an angel. He's a demon. This was an accident." You are helping him because that means you are not a human being. Human beings make choices. Human beings make decisions. Human beings are responsible for their actions. Human beings are responsible for their inaction. Human beings are not just there. Things don't just happen to human beings. That's why I don't like the phrase N magnet. You're not a magnet. Magnets are passive. Magnets do nothing. They're just there. You're not a magnet. You're a human being. You're an agent. So don't collaborate with the narcissist to convert you from a full-fledged human being to a magnet. <laughs> the second problem, if you don't admit your contribution, your role, the second problem is learned helplessness. If you, if you were abused to this extent and you could do nothing about it, and you did do nothing, then you're helpless. You're absolutely, mm -hmm. totally helpless. You're impotent. So this is called learned helplessness. So if you are helpless, if you're helpless means you can be abused again and again and again. It will happen to you endlessly until you die because you're helpless. There's nothing you could do. There's nothing you did do. You were just there waiting and the abuse came from nowhere. You had nothing to do with it. So if this happened to you once, maybe it can happen to you again. When we interview survivors of car crashes, airplane crashes, and natural disasters, this is the biggest problem. There is nothing you can do when you are in an airplane and the airplane crashes. Nothing you could do. Mm -hmm. So these people learn that they are totally helpless. Mm -hmm. And so at that moment, they develop PTSD. Mm -hmm. Post-traumatic stress disorder happens only when you feel that you are a thousand percent helpless. If mm -hmm. you believe that you can do something, if you believe that you have agency, you will never develop PTSD. Never. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As long as you believe that you can still do something, still affect your destiny, still make choices that will, will determine your life, as long as you believe this, you will not be traumatized. Trauma mm -hmm. is when you are a helpless object, like a baby, like a six months old baby. So the narcissist mm -hmm. infantilizes you. He, he, makes, he makes you, he regresses you. He makes you like a baby. And then when I go to, yeah. when I go to forums of victims and so on, they all sound like big babies. There's nothing mm -hmm. they could do. They were just like a baby. And someone came and I don't know, slapped them or beat them up, or I don't know what. It's not true. These people are not babies. They could. There's a lot they could have done. Many choices they could have taken, and many decisions they could have made. They did not make them. And they make up, they made other wrong choices and decisions, and they refuse to face this fact. How will they ever heal? How will they ever get rid of the trauma? And how will they ever avoid making the same mistake again? You know? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for, for this. And very, thank you, Sam, for these four steps before therapy, what people um, should do before they will, you know, start looking for a, a professional or whoever they want working with. Uh, because I think it's really important to understand that this is different uh, kind of abuse than, you know, uh, the other ones. So thank you so much for, for this. Have you got any advice or would you like to say something to to to, to people because i don't have uh, any question about that yeah narcissistic abuse is a unique experience and that is the reason mm -hmm. that i coined the phrase narcissistic abuse because people ask me immediately why do you need a special type of abuse why don't you just say abuse why do you say narcissistic mm -hmm. abuse what's so special mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what is special is this Typical abusers, they want something from you. They want to take your money. They want to have sex with you. They want to humiliate you. They like to humiliate you. They enjoy causing you pain. But they are, they are very goal-oriented and highly focused. Abuse is highly specific. That's why we have financial abuse, legal abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, psychological abuse, because abuse is narrow. Abuse is narrow. Yeah. It's like unique, like a tunnel. Narcissistic abuse is total, total. The aim of narcissistic abuse is to kill you mentally, to deprive you of autonomy, agency, independence, to take over your mind, to inject into you powerful introjects that you will th mistake and you will think they're you, to prevent you from diverging or deviating from an idealized image inside the mind of the narcissist, to cut you off family and friends and support networks, to, to deny you the opportunity to travel, work, or gain any form yeah. of independence. And so, so it's a total attack. I compare other forms of abuse to conventional war, while narcissistic abuse is nuclear war. No one survives. No one survives except the, the narcissist. So the this narcissist. is why this is why you cannot think of narcissistic abuse as ah, just another type of abuse. The damage is total to your body, to your mind, to your ability to think, to your ability to feel, to empathize, to survive, to function. Everything is damaged completely, massively. You need, in other words, to rebuild. You need reconstruction. While other forms of abuse, not narcissistic abuse, you need recovery. After narcissistic abuse, you need reconstruction. Not recovery. Recovery is not enough. You need reconstruction. Because you can recover from some effects, trauma and so on, but you will still mm -hmm. be destroyed, demolished. You need to rebuild yourself. That's, Thank you. That's true. Thank you so much uh, for, for the phrase that you coined. Thank you for your knowledge because uh, it's priceless. And thank, you for, thank you for your time. It was good to see you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Okay.